the block with Andrew Gurvich, a podcast about authentic people doing beautiful things. Enjoy the show. Program, ladies and gentlemen, your host Andy Gervich here. Uh, we are uh, creeping, I guess not really creeping, we are running uh, Usain Bolt style, swimming Michael Phelps and Katie Ledecky style. All right, I'm going to stop at the Olympics uh, now because I'll get a bunch of emails about how terrible the Olympics are. Uh, but we are, we are sprinting towards, pick your metaphor, uh, our year first year episode we couldn't be uh, more pleased with the direction of the show with how things have been going over this past year there's been a learning curve uh, as our show and as our format develops Uh, we are blown away by the kinds of guests uh, including this week's guest Ramez Nam more on him in a minute uh, who have been agreeing to come onto the program and that does not seem to be stopping anytime soon Uh, one of the things that I love about the show is the realization that there are many, 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 many more intriguing, transformative, powerful, beautiful, uh, humble, and empathetic people out there uh, to speak to than I will ever, than we will ever be able to get to here with the program. So as soon as I have 10 more ideas of folks to come on the show, we reach out and usually seven or eight of those folks say yes, and then that leads to another 15 or 20 people that we want to talk to. So it's like walking up uh, a hill made of sand, but in a very good sense, it's a good problem to have, right? To, to think about, especially with all the negativity, and, you know, in an election year, uh, and just in general, this narrative we have that the world is full of idiots and that, you know, uh, we and the handful of people that we surround ourselves with who have figured out all the answers, we got it right, but everybody else is an idiot. Uh, there's a tendency to think that out there. And then when you actually start sitting down with people, you cross these bridges and realize that uh, a lot of folks have a lot to bring to the table, even uh, with their own limitations that we have to navigate. Um, got to travel to the Southwest this past week to deal with some things relating to the death of my mother. And it was a kind of uh, difficult arduous pilgrimage for me to go sort through this stuff on my own this past week down there and I get to sit with a lot of old friends some high school friends a friend of mine who lives in the desert in California who's a police officer and we had dinner um, and just uh, got to talk about a lot of things I got to share with him a lot of the concerns that I have that people that I know and love in the Black Lives Matter movement and others uh, have about law enforcement in general Um, and law enforcement in specific over the past six months or a year uh, relating to the treatment of uh, especially men but of people of color um, in this country. And uh, when you sit down with a person and set the rhetoric aside and set the, uh, the flame bombs aside that we can so easily toss at one another, on Facebook and really look into a person's eyes and uh, and explore those disagreements and those the intersections of uh, experience, but then in those places where your experiences uh, uh, diverge greatly, there's a lot of wisdom there. And we, the more we take the time to do that, the better uh, we're all going to be. Um, to that end, our guest this week, <clears throat> Mr. Ramez Nam, born in Cairo, Egypt, came to the U.S. at the age of three, a uh, computer scientist, a futurist, an angel investor, an award, award-winning award author. I've been trying to get Ramez on the show since we started the program, and I'm so happy that he uh, was finally able to make it onto the program and our schedules were able to line up. Um, this is a guy that lectures around the, around the world on energy, on the environment, and on innovation, uh, who invests in innovative energy startups. He holds 19 patents related to search engines and information retrieval. 
retrieval and web browsing, uh, AI and machine learning. <clears throat> um, he's an award-winning author of some amazing books. The book Nexus, uh, uh, if you haven't read it, actually, that entire trilogy, uh, philosophical science fiction thrillers that uh, look at the impact of this increasingly plausible technology of the linking of human minds. Ramis spends a lot of time looking at emerging, tech emerging technologies and the effect that they have on the human condition. Um, so it's this kind of utopian, dystopian, it's its own thing, uh, world that is in the not too distant future that is having us navigate some of the very things that we, that are already upon us. You know, if you watch a show like Mr. Robot or many of the other things that are coming out right now, you see that there's this real conversation happening around this notion of transhumanism. And we've had a lot of guests on the show recently thinking of Mikey Siegel and thinking of Howard Bloom. Now I'm thinking of Ramez, who really challenge or at least complicate um, the trajectory <clears throat> that uh, everything's getting worse, we're all going to die, and everything's heading towards this sort of unavoidable apocalyptic flood. Um, it's one of the few things that folks um, across a handful of perspectives share. I came from a background of being an evangelical uh, fundamentalist Christian pastor. I've talked about that on this program before. And this idea that, you know, humanity is, is driving Thelma and Louise style right off the cliff and, and heading to its own impending and immediate destruction um, is something that is very much believed in, uh, in these monotheistic biblical contexts, right, that we are heading towards a kind of Armageddon, a final reckoning. Um, with our creator, with the transcendence, something even in Hindu cosmology, we, uh, we move further and further away from these states of original perfection until the entire thing collapses and starts over again. Um, folks that I know in uh, non-religious or non-monotheistic traditions or even in activist communities, a lot of progressives that I know, there's the, you know, the Chris Hedges model that the same thing, uh, we're, we're heading for total environmental catastrophe. We're heading for sociological and socioeconomic collapse and catastrophe. And these folks usher forth, um, many, many, many points, data points and, uh, anecdotal sorts of things in order to, to pull us into that kind of thinking. And it certainly is quite compelling. There is, some evidence for the reality of um, of our current way of living and thinking and being in the world not being what you would call sustainable um, or equitable for most people on the planet. Having said that, you know, when you read the work of a person like Timothy Ferris, when you look at Ramez Nam's work, when you look at Howard Bloom, Mikey Siegel, some of the other folks that have been on the show and some that we hope to get on, there's this other side of the story that says, hang on a second, the world is not really or, or simply moving into states of increasing catastrophe and entropy, that uh, we are innovating our way into uh, a, a kind of existence that has never been experienced by people on this planet before. And we can and are continuing to push that innovation to more efficiently uh, more ecologically and in a more balanced and equitable way improve the quality of life of not just a handful of elites and billionaires and uh, uh, self-proclaimed heirs to the human throne, but uh, actually for everybody's quality of life. And Ramez is one of the guys that's working on that and showing us that reality. Some of us have a real resistance to opening to this kind of thing because we've been so reared in this catastrophe narrative. Uh, but I challenge you to open up a little bit, take a look at his work, both his nonfiction and fiction, and, and see what you think. There are some profound and beautiful and amazing jaw-dropping things occurring in the world and right on the horizon. Um, I'm, I'm just fascinated by this argument. You know, the, the guy I call Papa Bear, Chris Ryan, who helped launch this particular program, he's not having any of it. And he, you know, he has this sort of back-to-the-land um, back to our hunter-gatherer kind of roots, or at least this great simplification and unplugging uh, and moving away from this notion that we're going to, uh, with technology, innovate ourselves into some higher form of existence. But Ramez and others are, are looking at exactly this sort of thing. So it's a fascinating conversation uh, that I think you're really going to enjoy. Um, two more things, and then we'll get you to Ramez and to the conversation. Um 
producer Mike DiNapoli, you know, we have a small team here uh, and on the block radio, and I've spoken regularly over the past couple weeks about uh, assistant producer Celeste Gervich and her impact on the show, not only the voice of the show uh, in so many ways, but a researcher, uh, question writer, somebody who helps me track down and book guests, who helps me prepare for the guests, who helps uh, build and cultivate the relationships that it takes uh, to get these people on the program. So I've spoken about uh, Celeste and will continue to about her uh, growing and profound impact on the program. I uh, just want to give a, a short shout out to producer Mike, um, <clears throat> the other person who just works tirelessly on this program. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I couldn't be more proud of the show that we produce. I've wanted for my entire life to make a show like this and now we do make a show like this and it sounds exactly like I wanted it to sound in my head all of these years. And uh, there's a guy named Mike DiNapoli at MD Productions who does that for us every week. Um, thankless job and usually one without any pay whatsoever. Um, so thank you, Mike. Thank you for the f- for the flawless and beautiful work you do on making this program every week. Um, the, the feedback we get from audience members um, <clears throat> telling us how meaningful the show is uh, in their lives and in the production of their art and in enhancing uh, and the complexity of their understanding of the world. Uh, Mike's every bit as much a part of that uh, as the rest of us are here at the show. So love your brother and keep up the fascinating work. Uh, lastly, a listener dedication. Haven't done one of these in a while and I'm thinking about bringing these back. We did those for a little bit in the beginning. Corey Skolnick, um, friend of the show, uh, friend of the writing literary community here in Portland, um, and has just been somebody who uh, always has something positive and uplifting to say about the program and the influence it's having in her life. I found out a while back that uh, Corey listens to the program um, while she's volunteering time helping women cross picket lines uh, to get safe, accessible reproductive care. Um, hearing that makes the show worthwhile for me. And, uh, you know, I almost want to say as long as uh, I hear that Corey is out there doing stuff like that, we're going to make sure we have this program up every week for her and her alone uh, to, to do that, that blessed, uh, blessed, difficult work. Uh, what an inspiration. When I hear stuff like that, my mouth just hits the floor. I'm so excited that anybody would listen to this program, much less people that are doing so much vital boots on the ground work. You want to talk about transformation, uh, helping women navigate the treachery sometimes of this very culture as they seek to have autonomy over their own goddamn bodies. Uh, so bless you, Corey, for all that you do. Thank you for being a part of the program. And uh, we just couldn't be more proud that you were a part of our team here. All right, Ramez Nam, folks, enjoy the program. Uh, we certainly enjoyed making it, and we will see you on the other side. Hi there, my name is Ramez Nam, and I'm here to talk about the power of ideas to save our planet. We live in a finite world. The average American uses three and a half tons of coal each year, 21 barrels of oil, 70 cubic feet of timber, 800 pounds of steel, and a stunning 500,000 gallons of water, mostly to grow our food. As a result of all of that, we emit, on average, 17 tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, each of us, each year. And so it's no accident that this past summer is the warmest summer ever recorded in North America, and that last year was the warmest year ever recorded on the planet. When we sum up our consumption across all of these things, we find that we're no longer using just one planet's worth of natural resources. We're now using about one and a half planet's worth of resources, something we can't maintain. 
And if everyone on Earth lived like an American, we'd be using five planet Earth's worth of resources. Well, we don't have five planet Earth's. So some look at this and say, clearly, what we have to do is we have to ratchet down. We have to give up our addiction to an energy-intensive, resource-intensive lifestyle. We have to give up on our mega cities and our mega cars and our mega freeways. And we have to get ready for a century of declines, where we'll all be poorer at the end of it, because it's the only way to save our planet. We've been warned that growth was about to send us into disaster in the past. In 1968, a fellow named Paul Ehrlich wrote a book where he warned us that explosive population growth was about to doom billions to starvation. Well, fortunately, it didn't happen. Ehrlich misunderstood and misestimated the amazing power of human innovation. Ideas, knowledge, technology, those aren't depleted or consumed by usage. They grow and accumulate over time. And ideas are the ultimate multipliers of the value of any other resource we have. Through them, we can grow richer while doing less damage. We've done it in agriculture. Earlier in our history, it took 6,000 acres to feed a single human being. Today in America, it takes about half an acre. We've used less land to feed more people. We've done it in computing. If an iPhone were built using the same efficiency as ENIAC in the 1940s, it would be larger than the city of Chicago and consume 10 times the electricity of the entire state of California. We've even done it recently with resources like oil and water. The average American and European now use about 30% less of both of these than we did in 1970, even as our economies have doubled on a per-person basis. We are learning through knowledge to grow richer while using less. Now, the most important thing we can innovate on in the future is abundant, clean energy. The sun strikes the Earth with 6,000 times the amount of energy that human civilization uses. Every 88 minutes, the sun hits the Earth with as much energy as we use in a year. If we had solar cells deployed with current efficiencies on one-third of 1% 1 of Earth's land surface, that would collect enough energy to meet our projected needs through 2030. The problem is that solar is very expensive. Today, solar cells cost about twice per unit of electricity as burning coal. Fortunately, innovation, the power of ideas, is at play here too. In 1954, when solar photovoltaics were invented, they cost $1,000 a watt. Today, they cost around $2 a watt. This is a, a wafer of photovoltaic cells. If they look like computer chips, it's because they, that's how they're built. And like computers, they are rapidly dropping in price for performance. At this rate, if we keep innovating, in 10 years, solar electricity will cost the same as coal electricity. And in 20 years, if we keep it up, it'll cost half what coal does, giving us an abundant, clean, and cheap source of power to fuel our prosperity while reducing our impact on the planet. One more key trait makes knowledge unique among all resources. Information, ideas replicate. They're viral. They spread from person to person. And they're non-zero. They give benefit to more people without taking it away from the original creator. And that's why these women in the village of Tinginaput in Orissa in India have solar cells. Their government is training them to install solar panels in their village and other villages nearby. Now, these barefoot solar engineers, as they're referred to, are all illiterate. They never learn to read or write. But because of the uh, cheap solar lights in their home, their daughters will learn to read and write, and their daughters may one day produce innovations that will benefit all of us. So innovations, ideas, those are the infinite resource. They can multiply the value of anything else, and they grow rather than being depleted. If we learn to harness them and keep the growth going, then humanity as a whole can grow richer while we reduce our impact on the planet. Thank you very much. So population growth is a very real concern. Uh, when we were hunter-gatherers, there were about 5 million people on the planet. Now there's 7 billion, and we're headed towards 9 billion, maybe even 10 billion by the middle of the century. And some environmentalists would say population growth is at the root of all environmental problems. And many people would say, hey, we have to end it and we have to shrink the population dramatically. Well, first, population growth is slowing. In 1950, the average woman on Earth 
had five children over the course of her lifetime. Now, the average woman on Earth will have about two and a half children over the course of her lifetime. And when that reaches two, that's the magic replacement rate. And we're on track to hit that. So we're, by the middle of the century, we will have ended population growth most likely. Now, all that having been said, is a smaller population better? Because human brains are the sources of ideas, and ideas multiply all of the resources and make your life better. So ask yourself this, would you be better off if fewer people had lived before you, or if more people had lived before you? If fewer, maybe they would have used up fewer finite resources, but then fewer people would have come up with all these great ideas that enhance your life, whether it's antibiotics, or the electric light, or the internet, or television, or radio, or the automobile. All of those came from human minds. So human minds are a ultimate source of wealth in a certain sense, in the same way that human mouths, our consumption, is a, is a depleter of some resources. So we have to find a balance. Now, the other very exciting thing is that it's possible that more people means more innovation, even more than it means more consumption. What I mean is twice as many people means twice as much consumption, but it might mean three times as much innovation. And we can see that throughout history. If you look at the starting points of different disconnected continents, the ones that started with the highest population, the highest land area, were the ones where the most innovation happened. You look at Eurasia and Africa together as one large landmass. That's where the bulk of the innovations over the last uh, several millennium came from, up until the time of Columbus when people connected again. And that's in large part because they started with a larger population. The Americas had uh, Stone Age technology, agriculture somewhat, but didn't have the metals or the printing press or the astronomy that had existed there in Europe and Asia. Australia, smaller and more separate, uh, didn't even have agriculture. But they did have some tools, the boomerang and, and other sophisticated tools they created. Tasmania, separate from Australia and smaller, didn't even have those tools. So the places that had the most people produced the most new ideas, and those ideas then spread to everyone in those land masses. So it's a double-edged sword. People are sources not just of consumption, but of innovation.
right, welcome to the show, folks. This is your host, Andy Gervich. Our guest this week is Ramez Nam. Ramez was born in Cairo, Egypt, and came to the U.S. at the age of three. He's a computer scientist, futurist, angel investor, and award-winning author. Ramez spent 13 years at Microsoft, where he led teams developing early versions of Microsoft Outlook, Internet Explorer, and the Bing search engine. His career is focused on bringing advanced collaboration, communication, and information retrieval capabilities to roughly one billion people around the world. I bet that number is growing. Uh, and took him to, uh, to the role of partner and director of program management with Microsoft, with deep experience leading teams on working on cutting edge technologies such as machine learning, search, massive scale services, and artificial intelligence. Between stints at Microsoft, Ramez founded and ran Apex Nanotechnologies, the world's first company devoted entirely to software tools to accelerate molecular design. He holds 19 patents related to search engines, information retrieval, web browsing, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. He lectures on energy, environment, and innovation at Singularity University, and Ramez invests in innovative energy startups. He's spoken to audiences on four continents, from Illinois to Istanbul, uh, and from corporate boardrooms to Harvard University. He's appeared on Sunday Morning, MSNBC, repeatedly on Yahoo Finance, on China Cable Television, Big Think, and Reuters.fm. His work has appeared in or been reviewed by the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, the Atlantic, Slate, Business Week, Business Insider, oh boy, Discover, Popular Science, Wired, and Scientific American. We'll add NPR to that, right? Didn't they just put a thing up today about Nexus? Just today. That's fantastic, man. I just read it, actually, when you posted it. It was a great review. Hey, thanks. A graduate of University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign and the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy at Aurora, Illinois. Uh, I'm reading your whole bio, man, because it's fascinating, <laughs> right? And so at the end of this, we'll only have about four minutes for questions, but just hang I on. <laughs> be careful what I put in my online bio. Yeah, 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 exactly. We don't know your sign yet, but we'll get to that. I'm going to change it to he's just some guy. He's some guy. In your leisure time, which I, don't, I can't imagine you have any of, you've climbed mountains, descended into icy crevices or crevasses, uh, as the case may be, chased sharks through their native domain, which is a terrible sounding idea. <laughs> Backpacked through remote corners of China, another awful idea, and ridden his bicycle down hundreds of miles of the Vietnam coast. You live in Seattle where you write and speak full time. You're also the author of five award-winning books, which we're going to get to in a minute. But Ramez, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here, Andy. And I just want to say I put my pants on one leg at a time. <laughs> well, we'll get to that. I'm not so sure that's true. Uh, we'll find out by the second segment. I want to ask you a bit about, I mean, let's just start at the beginning, right? So you moved here when you were three years old from Egypt. Yeah. And what, what made your family decide to come over here? Uh, my mom uh, was in school and she got basically a scholarship to come over and finish her PhD in the States. And then they got here and realized this was a way better place to live and a way better better place for a kid to grow up hmm. and uh, didn't want to leave. What did your parents do in Egypt? Uh, they both, uh, they're physicians, actually. They both went to med school. They met and fell in love in med school in Egypt. In Egypt. And then did they continue that work here, both of them? Yep. Yep, they did. Uh, so I have a couple questions for you about that. I mean, that you have a really, you know, I've followed your, your social media posts for a while, and especially in this... Uh, this current election cycle, when we kind of have this, this you know, renewed xenophobia and anti-immigrant push, you, you kind of have the classic American dream immigrant story, right? I mean, how, is, how has that experience shaped your understanding, not only of your own life, but of, I guess, the American experience? I mean, the most important thing that happened in my life was my folks coming to the U.S. and then deciding to stay. Mm -hmm. Like That definitely gave me a far better life. Uh, but it's also done good things for America. Like, my folks, they... They're doctors. They save lives. It's what mm. they do. And, you know, I see that a lot of immigrants, I've worked in tech, so a lot of immigrants come here to do awesome work that makes the world better. You know, uh, Google founded by the son of an immigrant, right? Like things like that. So if we didn't have good immigration policy, we might not have Google. And I think the world would be poorer and Americans would be poorer for that. 
you know, you make a really interesting point. Um, I'm a college professor and, and I'm a writing teacher. And, and in one of the writing classes, one of the kind of rudimentary classes we have at the college, um, students learn things like resume writing and things like this. And one of the things we always stress is that, like, yes, you want to put your qualifications. Yes, you want to represent yourself to this company or organization. But um, when you go to an interview, people make the mistake of talking uh, exclusively about how important the job will be to them, how much the job's going to mean to them, how much the wage and the benefits are going to mean for them. And they never talk about what they're going to bring to that company or that organization. And in this immigration conversation, we always talk about, you know, folks getting the opportunity to come have the American dream, folks getting the opportunity to come out of a, a country where the economy or there's an oppressive regime of one kind or another and how much it benefits them. But you bring up how this country itself, so much of what makes it great is comes from the work and the sacrifice of immigrants. Yeah, I mean, it, everything. If you go to the grocery store and you get strawberries or tomatoes in winter, mm -hmm. that's because some um, uh, immigrants from Latin America picked those for you. And frankly, Americans mostly don't want those jobs. But if you then go use uh, Google or eBay or Intel mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, like any of your computers or an iPhone, you're using something either built by an immigrant or by the son of an immigrant. Like Steve Jobs, the iPhone, son of a Syrian immigrant. Isn't that amazing? Right. Yeah. 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 Syri Anti-Syrian immigrants, there's no iPhones. <laughs> right? Yeah. And so, All these people walking around playing Pokemon Go <laughs> would be screwed. So people are like, they're going to take our jobs. Uh, and they have the same risk of taking your job as a new baby being born, in a certain sense. Like mm -hmm. every new person is competition, right? Right. But they also they create this value that uh, everyone in the world gets to share in, but especially we Americans. Like... We'd be worse off with like no iPhones, no smartphones at all, no Google, no computer chips. Basically, all of those things are made possible by the contributions of immigrants. George Lopez makes that joke uh, when he says, uh, you know, all of us white people love our whole foods. That if we kick all the Mexicans out of this country, there won't be a blueberry within 60 miles of this place. Absolutely. <laughs> right. And, he, you know, it's, it, it, as only he can say it, but he hits on something very important that you just did. I don't know if you've ever seen the uh, – there's a, like a meme online. It's a little bit old now. Family sitting around a table like uh, hands held saying, uh, thank you, Jesus, for this food. And then the next frame is uh, uh, a Hispanic farmer uh, picking stuff from the field. And it, it's Jesus. And he says, de nada. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's the reality. <laughs> no kidding. Well, so what about the Egyptian side of your heritage? Do you feel connected to that? Do you go back? to that you know, country I've, I've been back a number of times but i'm i'm american uh, i had an ex-girlfriend of mine used to call me a coconut brown on the outside <laughs> but on the inside uh so i think it's fascinating just knowing that you were born in another country and having parents that are from another country you get a mirror into how the rest of the world mm -hmm. works and you realize that the world does not end at america's borders right and that by itself is a big deal and uh, that's interesting to hear. And, and the reason I ask that uh, is because when I was preparing to speak with you, one of the things that struck me, I'm a professor of world religions, and uh, I was thinking about um, your work in coding and in the, in the history of ideas and in technology in both aspects, right? Technologies that we create to transform the world outside and make human life better or change our existence in some way. But then technologies um, also that, that I guess are internal technologies that, that, uh, that accentuate a change in consciousness. And uh, writing code or using symbols or script to do both things, right? To, to, mat to manipulate the external world and also to navigate the internal world in some sense there's nothing more egyptian than that <laughs> you know i never really thought about that but i think that is a good point yeah you know i go back to the papyrus of ani right in the egyptian yeah. book of the dead and this is exactly what this was this is people writing script writing code um to do both things to change the outer i mean what is hieroglyph if not that is is sort of a map an algorithm or a technology for expanding symbolic consciousness so in that sense, I, you know, I think that, that I, I see you carrying on that very ancient human tradition that, I, you know, the Egyptian people really, if they didn't start, certainly took to a new level. Yeah, I mean, that it's one of the birthplaces of civilization, mm -hmm. so happy to carry some of that torch on now. How did you start into this world of, uh, of computer coding and all that? I mean, what was your, where did you guys, did you land in Seattle from Egypt, or where did your family go first? Land in the Midwest, St. Louis, Missouri. Wow. St. Louis, Missouri. Um, 
That's different. It's very different than than Seattle on the West Coast. Yeah, and went, Egypt. <laughs> and Egypt. Uh, I went to a Catholic elementary school. I'm an atheist myself, but I, I got to I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> that, yeah. That's probably why I'm an atheist, actually. <laughs> but it was still a, a good experience. And uh, one day when I was in maybe, I don't know, third or fourth grade, they got a Commodore VIC-20. Oh, in. I remember the day. Things. And I got to play with it a little bit. And then I realized it was cool. I could make it do things. And that's where it started. That started your love for it, huh? Yeah, absolutely. I just learned that it was an, sort of an infinite canvas that you could do anything with. And what was the road from there to Microsoft? I studied computer science in college, mm-hmm. and Microsoft made me a job offer as I was graduating. Uh, and I flew out to Seattle to interview. That's how I got the offer. Mm-hmm. And I fell in love with Seattle, and that was it. And that was it. And so, I mean, how, when did you start there? Uh, 1995. Wow. Of 95. Yep. So a little bit of this is right place, right time. I mean, we're never in the world going to be able to create that set of conditions again. Well, it was right place, right time. But, you know, somebody who started at uh, Facebook five years ago or somebody who started at WhatsApp two years ago or somebody who started at Instagram two years ago. Yeah. uh, They've also been transformative uh, and they've had good opportunities. Yeah, that's true. That's a really good point. Did you, um, I mean, so how did you, so I know a lot of people were coming into the organization at that time, but you, you rose up in the ranks pretty quickly. How did that happen? You know, I was always passionate about what the product was. Like okay. my favorite thing was defining the product, thinking about what customers want. Mm-hmm. And I loved thinking about it as sort of human augmentation. How do I make it easier for people to send and receive information? All right. My first product that I worked on was email for many years. Yeah. Uh, web browser. Outlook. Search. Yeah, Outlook. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so how do you make it easier and faster to send the information that you want to organize, you know, Google's motto now, organize the world's information. How do you make it easier to organize the emails that you're getting? How do you get rid of the spam? How do you see this as high priority? How do you track what you've got to do? So all of that to me was about augmenting the human mind so I could work faster and more productively. That's fascinating. I mean, do you ever sit back and, I mean, did you know in 95 where it was going in terms of, you know, this global computer revolution? I mean, did you have an idea? Did you folks have an idea how big things were going to get? You know, I mean, Bill Gates' vision then was a computer on every desktop Mm -hmm. running Microsoft software. And in retrospect, you know, that looked, that sounded super audacious. It was not audacious enough. Now it's a computer in every pocket. Yeah, I was going to say, people have seven computers now, right? They have a desktop, a laptop, a a tablet, three phones. And going forward, it's going to be, yeah, a computer on every object, a computer in every object. Uh, That's what the world is heading towards. You know, I just before I came to speak with you today uh, was in uh, Outlook setting appointments uh, for with professors that I have to have conversations with over the summer about things we're doing next term. And so that product is still very much integrated, especially in educational environments. That's got to feel very gratifying to you. It is gratifying. I mean, it, you know, I haven't worked on it in many years, mm-hmm. but I like the feeling of having to having a chance to impact people and having a chance to give them more ability to do what they want to do in the world. So you were 13 years at Microsoft, and then uh, what made you decide to leave? Well, I quit twice. I quit to <laughs> found a startup, uh-huh. uh, and that didn't work out. And then I, after that, I wrote my first book, More Than Human. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is nonfiction about right. human enhancement. Went back to work at Microsoft, and after another six, seven years, it was just time to to try something else, and I wanted to try writing some more. Yeah, and so I actually have some questions about the books that we'll get into in a second, and starting with those. But I guess uh, what I'm fascinated by is this this entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, what what astounds me, you know. So I'm, again, I'm a college professor, and I'm heading into my last year. I'm, uh, I've been teaching. Uh, for about 10 years, but full-time for the past four. And I'm in my last year of a tenure process. Okay. So after next year, I'm tenured. And what that means is I'm kind of, as you know, vested at the institution. Mm -hmm. So I have a job there guaranteed as long as the institution exists. And that's a a mixed blessing, right? If you're talking about having a a guaranteed paycheck to pay the bills and, 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 you know, and live your life, then that's great. But I know a lot of people who, they say tenure is the death of an academic because you stop wanting to take risks. You stop wanting to take chances. And how do you have the balls to walk away from a position in Microsoft like that? Well, 
you know, I believe in entrepreneurship mm-hmm. and being a writer certainly is entrepreneurial. Yeah. Uh, but what we find is that, you know, some entrepreneurs come from, from poor backgrounds, but if you have some sense of security, it's easier to take a risk. Right. So for me, the sense of security was knowing that I could go back to a job in tech. And frankly, I had it easy because I had, I had worked in tech. I knew people at Microsoft and other companies. I was pretty confident that I could get another job right. if I needed to. Mm-hmm. Um, and honestly, most writers don't have that kind of security. That's a good so point. So it's, it's much more sink or swim for them. So I've had it cushy compared to a lot of people. That freedom probably made the book the, the books better because people can't smell that desperation in your, in, <laughs> in your prose that a lot of us have in our right. Maybe it might make me lazy. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> so the company you started in between, was that Apex Nanotechnologies? That's correct. Yeah. So t- can we talk a little bit about that before we get into the writing? Because we'll spend the rest of the show talking about your books. But yeah. what, was the, what was that company uh, set to do? What were you trying to do with that company? So Nanotech was a a big uh, boom in in those years. It was like 2001. And we were trying to make sort of the AutoCAD of Nanotech, a piece of software that could do computer-aided design uh, to make it possible to build things at the nanoscale, new materials, drugs, uh, little robots. And it turns out there's lots of science that already exists on how to model what happens there. Mm-hmm. Like, if I make X, Y, Z, how will it behave? Right. Uh, but it's incredibly hard to use. You have to basically have a PhD in something called computational chemistry to use this stuff. Wow. So we wanted to put a really easy front end on it. On it, okay. Uh, and then I just, it was during the, the dot bomb, the dot com crash happened right after we started the company. September 11th happened. Oh and boy. And it was exceptionally bad timing. Yeah, that that sounds like horrible timing. There was a, a, a diet pill in the late 70s and early 80s called AIDS. I don't know if you remember, oh. and it was their commercials were like, you know, get your AIDS, it'll help you lose weight, oh, you know, and, uh, and they had to had to pull it from oh. the shelves immediately. I bet they did. Yeah, and so I don't know what made me think of that, but this um, that's unfortunate timing. Where is the nanotech uh, industry now? Like, where are we at with that? Well, honestly, it hasn't gone nearly as fast as we expected either, so I don't think our business plan would have worked either at a different time. Um, it, there is stuff happening, but it's really mostly on uh, materials. We can make you know, materials out of different sizes of grains and mm-hmm. you get different metals that have different colors or different bending properties or different strengths. So in that area, we're doing really well, but really nobody is all that much closer to nanobots as we imagined it. What about biological tech in terms of like biocomputing? I've been reading about this as something that's coming down the, down the pike. Yeah, so biology is nanotech. Proteins okay. are little nanomachines, mm-hmm. but they're they're like... Escher like or like HR Geiger like yeah. nano machines they're nothing at all like what a human being would design mm-hmm. so we're learning to harness them to do all sorts of things i mean when we talk about uh, gene therapy or cell therapeutics or all these sort of new ways of treating disease that's basically what we're doing is nanotech in a way we're editing viruses or editing genes um and then we you look at other things if you get insulin mm-hmm. today Probably it came from a genetically engineered E. coli that has been engineered to create human insulin in big vats. Wow. Effectively, that is nanotechnology, uh, but it's the kind that actually works. It's, we're taking advantage of all the technology that nature's already built and learning. Like It's like we've picked up this alien technology that nature gave us, and we're tweaking it to serve our purposes. That's very- remarkable. I've, saw, I've seen some work that's being done where people are, are using yeast to, to transmit information as well. Do you know much about that work? And not specifically. They're, uh, they're stripping it of its uh, and just using it as a carrier. It was the same program where I saw the thing about the the spider goats that the the Department of Defense has. Do you know about those spider goats? I do the goats that make uh, spider silk. Spider silk that they use to yeah. make the uh, that basically that uh, Under Armour for soldiers. Yeah. Yep. God, that's remarkable. And I know as far as gene therapy, this is actually making it out into practice now, right? Isn't that what was used on President Carter's cancer? I don't know what was used on Carter's cancer, but it, it is trying to make it out into practice. We've had a few things actually approved by the FDA or in Europe uh, that that are real gene therapies targeting cancer, targeting a kind of blindness, targeting a rare autoimmune disease, basically bubble boy disease, something called Ada Skid. Hmm. So it's starting to happen. Is this going to change the nature of computing at some point? 
You know, I'm not as optimistic about biocomputing as okay. some people are. I think we're going to use, like, every cell is a computer. So we're going to use our ability to tweak biology to tweak the program instructions for the cells in your body. Uh-huh. I think that's much more plausible than really doing using biology to do computing of the kind we do today. A um, couple more questions before we go to break, just about tech and your and starting to get into your nonfiction books. And then when we come back, I want to talk about the, the Nexus series. And congratulations. I want to find out where you are with Paramount and Darren Aronofsky. That's mm-hmm. huge news. Um, but uh, I guess two questions. Um, so, I mean, I guess, would you would you categorize yourself as a transhumanist? I don't, actually. I don't oh, use that word. Okay. I use it in my novels a whole right. bunch, but I really dislike that word. For okay, how come? Uh, because everyone in the world is a transhumanist, almost. <laughs> if basically everyone in the world, if you offer them some product or service that makes their life better, yeah. that enhances their ability to think or to communicate or slows down the aging process or makes them stronger, people like it. Right. It's just that they don't want to be first. They don't want to do it if it's too weird. They don't want to do it if it's too expensive. But what's weird and so on changes over time. Yeah. Like – Every woman that takes hormonal birth control Mm -hmm. is not just a transhumanist. She's a transhuman. Right. Right. Uh, Everyone that's had LASIK. I have contact lenses. Uh, Anyone that has a pacemaker. uh, In the U.S., there's like $30 billion spent on sports nutrition supplements that don't work, by the way. Wow. But that's $30 billion spent by people looking to augment their abilities. Yeah. Everyone that takes smart drugs or reads a book on speed reading or plays mind training games. Like, we're all almost all are looking to augment our abilities. Anybody that puts their kid in like a pre-K special program or gets some educational games on their iPads, like it's all the same stuff. So it's just the people that call themselves transhumanists are using a weird word, a word that's intentionally, I think, divisive. Yeah. uh, And are thinking about the technology that doesn't exist yet. Well, what's going to happen 20 years from now? Um, And so that looks weird. But when we get there, it'll look less weird. You know, you bring up a really good point, and it, and it leads to another question I was going to ask you, but one of the things I've always appreciated about your writing and about your social media presence is you really try to force people to, to, to dissect these things we throw around, and GMO is another one of those things that you kind of push back against people that, that have this kind of just anti-GMO stance, and you go, hang on a second, right? Like, all you weed smokers out there, all you people <laughs> that eat corn, uh, you know, any of these things have all been, you know, anyone who's eating a banana, you're eating a genetically modified organism or watermelon or anything else um and so this idea you know as again as a professor of religious studies i I, uh, studied this over time looking at how religious people have responded to medical technology and this idea of you know certain cults that that say oh we we don't uh play god and so they don't allow their children to get insulin if they need it or to have a surgery if they need it um and but but they will wear glasses or contact lenses and, and exactly what you just said um in when when general General anesthesia was introduced. Um, pastors took out whole page. They did whole page editorials in the New York Times and other places, saying that we shouldn't give women anesthetic during childbirth because the, it was going to over. It was going to trump the Genesis curse of giving them uh, increased pain in childbirth. And so to give them anesthetic during this would be to somehow be playing God and taking that away. And so you're right. Not only as the needle moves forward, does the response change, but this idea of what's normal, what's accepted and what isn't. And to, um, to, to say some, you know, transhumanist or GMO, speak a little bit about that, I guess, since there's a question in there. Like you've, yes. So there is this, you're totally right. There's this long history of being squicked, you know, creeped out by biological technology, mm-hmm. the smallpox vaccine. 200 years ago, Jenner made the smallpox vaccine by scraping the sores of cows that had cowpox, Mm. and that grossed people out. And so we have this natural gross reaction uh, to anything involving fluids or anything involving like tweaking what we eat, uh, and so we freak out. But in reality, the GMOs that are that are made now have one or two or three genes tweaked out of maybe 20 or 30,000 genes. Mm. If you just reshuffle if you just do hybrids conventionally you just plant seeds and like take the ones you're shuffling thousands of genes yeah and you're creating new mutations that you're shuffling too every crop that we eat basically did not exist in nature ten thousand years ago right 
And then the science is just really clear. Like we've studied all the intentional GMOs we've created and they are just as safe as any other food. They're probably safer than organic food, hmm. to be honest. Uh, but people don't want to accept that. We no pick, one wants that message, yeah. Yeah, we pick what we believe sort of emotionally and tribally and then we use our brains to create justifications to back up those beliefs. Yeah, I mean the ultimate GMO is dog breeding, right? I mean if there's something that creates an ethical problem, it's, it's that. <laughs> I mean you're really yeah, I mean, playing God. All dogs from chihuahuas to mastiffs descended from wolves, right? Mm. And that's in humans have done all that tweaking. And it's ginormous what we've changed there. Right. Yeah. I'm not sure they all go to heaven either. I'm calling bullshit on that. <laughs> um, what, you know, one more, an energy question for you, and then we'll take a break and then come back and talk about the writing and stuff. Is that cool? Yeah. Um, so the bloom box, do you know much about that? I do. Okay. Tell us about that a little bit. And for our audience that doesn't know, it's a it's a self-generating power mechanism, right? So it generates power on site and it uses like a sand-based compound, sort of. Is that sort of correct? Blue, Bloom is actually struggling. So what they are is they're a fuel cell technology. Okay. So you can put material in and it's like a generator, except that it's twice as efficient as a generator. Mm -hmm. It's quiet. It's silent. Uh, and so you can get more power out of the same amount of fuel and thus it's cleaner. Um, but there, and it's an, an awesome idea, but the reality is that innovation is hard and it's usually Darwinian. Yeah. So I write, I write a ton about solar, right? And solar has had this enormous price drop. It's gone down by a factor of 200 X is how much the price has dropped wow. in my lifetime. Batteries are dropping at the same pace. Like batteries are dropped by about 5x in cost over the last uh, 5 to 10 years. That's amazing. It's enormous pace of innovation. But that means that it's highly competitive and a technology that can't keep up uh, is like left by the wayside. And so most companies that start new things in this fail. Like people mm -hmm. complain about Solyndra failing. We should have had more failures because you need companies trying big things, knowing that most of them will fail. And that's how you get to the point that a few things that are really awesome mm. that have the biggest innovations win and that's what makes life better for all of us who are sort of customers of that technology Solyndra was the title energy company right no Solyndra was a solar company that received some grants from oh, that's right. the department of energy that republicans love to hate because uh, it got some loan guarantees but like really who cares like right. it was one company the the department of energy had a few hundred companies in that program and i think three of them failed outright and if that's your batting average, you're not trying hard enough. Right. That's a good you're not, point. You're not aggressive enough. Uh, the audit, they should have tried more risky things and had more companies fail. That's how you get to faster innovation. So you think uh, Bloom isn't so much the point as what it sets the table for for what comes next? Yeah, it's not Bloom. It's just that innovation overall in clean energy is going at this enormous pace in solar and wind and batteries and lots of things. Um, and do you think we're going to, lastly, before the break, uh, do you think that innovation is going to outpace where, you know, our, you know, to me and maybe to a lot of folks out here just, you know, that, that aren't as close to some of this, these emerging technologies as you are, there seems to be this race between our, our collapse as a species due to climate change and overpopulation and instability from war and these things and this push towards these innovations that, that are going to and are already changing our life for the better. And so do you think this innovation is going to outpace the, the, the catastrophe? Well, I think overall life is going to get better. Mm -hmm. With climate change specifically, uh, we're going to run the engine into the red yeah. for the, the whole planet, and it's, climate change is going to get worse before it gets better for a long time, and it's going to take decades to turn that corner. Mm -hmm. But I think we'll do it. I, we'll survive, and life will ultimately be better, but we'll take some, some hard hits and leave some scars we'll be recovering from for a long time. For a long time. Well, we're going to go to break now, and when we come back, I want to talk to you about uh, specifically uh, your books, and I want to start with More Than Human and the Infinite Resource, but then I want to get into the Nexus trilogy. Okay. Cool. You're listening to On the Block Radio, folks. Our guest is the author, innovator, technology wizard, Ramez Nam, and we will be back after these words. You are listening to On the Block, where geniuses go to twerk. More after this. Hi there. 
I'm Ramez Nam. I'm the author of a science fiction novel called Nexus. Nexus is a story about a technology in our brains that allows us to send our thoughts, our images, our senses back and forth, mind to mind, linking us together. But if you think about it, we already have such technology. We can transmit what we're thinking via the internet, via our phones, via text messages, via writing, and via books. These technologies link us together into a kind of global brain where we are together greater than the sum of our parts. And censorship that prohibits, stops, or impedes the flow of ideas in this global brain acts as a kind of brain damage, dumbing us down as a society. Now, if you're watching this video inside the United States, you are part of a grand experiment, democracy. That experiment rests on a few key cornerstones. One of those, of course, is the right of the governed to choose who governs them, the power to vote. But another, equally important, is the right of individuals to express themselves and its counterpart, the right of individuals to freely access information, to access information about what's happening in our society, to access information about the expressions that others have made. This empowers individuals, it empowers their votes, it makes their votes more informed. Those two things that go hand in hand, access to information and the free expression of the self, are equally important. In fact, without them, the power to vote becomes less powerful and the populace can be subverted. That is why the First Amendment to the Constitution of the U.S. says that Congress shall create no law that prohibits the expression of speech or that prohibits the freedom of the press, because that is so important in enabling the populace to use their vote wisely. Books are just as important. Books are, in fact, part of that freedom of the press. They are, in fact, part of that freedom of speech, and they are a vital way that we access information about our world. Books are banned for all sorts of reasons. Ideas and freedom of speech are banned for all sorts of reasons. They're banned because they offend. They're banned because they don't meet up with someone's idea of propriety. But they're banned often, and perhaps most dangerously, not because of what they say, but because of who they threaten. And when a book or an idea is banned because of who it threatens, it's banned because it threatens the powerful. And that is one of the best reasons there is to write and to publish a book, because it threatens the powerful. Indeed, when we see a book that has been banned, that should keenly attract our interest. That should draw us to such a book, such an idea, and uh, draw us to at least consider the ideas within for a moment for a little while to see what's inside of that, because that's a keen thing that may be well worth our attention. Indeed, it was Thomas Jefferson, one of the architects of our democracy, who said, when the government engenders fear in the people, then you have tyranny. But when the government is frightened of the people, then you have liberty. I believe that's true at every level, in every form of authority. When those who have power make the people who are responsible to them afraid, then you have tyranny. But when those who have power are at least a little bit frightened of those who they are responsible to and for, then you have liberty. So let us encourage the freedom of expression in all forms, in our books, in our writing, in our physical spaces, online, and in every other way that we can. And then we'll create a world that has more liberty rather than less. Thank you very much. Digital technologies have transformed how we consume books, the news, video, music. We go to YouTube and we have millions and millions of videos we can get at the touch of our fingers, but they haven't changed how we do education. Why can't we make 
every student's experience based upon the tons of free content we could create and personalize it based on mining billions of people's behavior to that learner. So we mostly can learn about what others are doing and try to amplify it. But others out there are, experience, are experimenting with that. Our Khan Academy was founded by a man who decided to start putting online videos, teaching courses. And now they have tens of millions of people have viewed their videos. And people think of it as a place where you can go and see online videos. But they also have online quizzes that test your proficiency. And based on the quizzes and data mining what other people have done, they can actually see, based on data, whether or not you're ready to go to the next step. And so now they're starting to look at can they experiment with uh, two different versions of a video to see if one teaches better than the other. And that's actual science in the process of education, something we don't do enough of. A social entrepreneur often sees that opportunity but thinks of it in terms of uh, a social good, usually a triple bottom line actually, that's what we talk about. A social good, a good for people, and a good for the planet is the ideal. So they see here is something that is not being done that can help people or can help the world and a way to do it in a way that makes enough money to keep it sustaining or to make a profit at the same time. That's the best way because that keeps it uh, sustaining or growing at the same time. We're delighted that the city is, is sort of uh, far-sighted enough to want to bring us here to try to hopefully try to make some of that same change in, in Buenos Aires. The Infinite Resource, uh, The Power of Ideas on a Finite Planet. Uh, this book looks at the environmental and natural resource challenges of climate change, energy, water, and food, and charts a course uh, to meet those challenges by investing in scientific and technological innovation needed to overcome them. And, you know, I was fascinated with this book when uh, when it came out, and it's one of the reasons I wanted to, to talk with you. And uh, I, I saw a video that uh, you have posted somewhere about um, what you call ideas that have sex. <laughs> and I yes. wanted to just ask you about that and about the book and if you can maybe talk a little bit about both. So the, the book is basically just saying, look, things are bad. Like overall, life is actually good. This is the best time to be born as a human being. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to things like climate change or ocean overfishing, uh, there are some really, really bad, scary issues and they're real. Uh -huh. uh, but it's probably not the end of the world if we do the right things. We've overcome other problems before. You know, we had the ozone hole right. in the 70s. We had air pollution in New York City and smog in L.A. that looked like Shanghai, yeah. Beijing look today. And no one talks about those things anymore because we just beat them. We had in Cleveland, we had a river catch on fire, the Cuyahoga River, like wow. it caught on fire in 1969. And we turn the corner on a whole bunch of those things. Wow. And so if we act smart, if we create the right policies, and if we keep innovating in technology, you know, in, in clean energy like solar and wind and batteries, we can do this. It, it will get worse before it gets better on those axes. But there's every reason to believe that we can have, you know, nine or ten billion people on this planet living a lifestyle that is far richer than most Americans live today, uh, living a 1% lifestyle, frankly, hmm. while still leaving the planet cleaner and better off and shrinking our environmental footprint. And that's not a fairy tale. That's possible, you're saying? 
that's possible. The math says it's possible. The technology is heading in that direction. It's really just about speed, the race between innovation and destruction. You know, there's a lot of folks, you know, we've interviewed uh, Stephen Schwartz on the show. We haven't had Tim Ferriss on yet, but Timothy's written and spoken about this as well. Do you know him? I know who Tim is. We yeah. don't know each other. Okay. I think you guys would benefit from speaking with each other, but he, he pushes back against this solely apocalyptic narrative. He says, yes, the challenges are real and present and, and, and time sensitive, but also uh, the, the exact same thing you're saying. He, he talks about how the media and IQ right now is like 135 or something like that. It's like 25 points higher than it was in the 1890s. Well, yeah, so there's this thing called the Flynn effect, which is that if you – IQ is always curved each year for that cohort. Mm. If you get rid of that curve, IQ in most of the world has risen by about three points per decade. Wow. Uh, and some of that's probably better nutrition. It's better exposure of kids to books, even TV and movies, maybe even video games. Stephen Johnson thinks that – it's not just their knowledge has gotten better, it's their abstract reasoning. They really like rotate objects in yeah. space. And I think it's just because their brains get more nutrition and get more of a workout. So tell us about this ideas that have sex thing. That sounds saucy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's an idea uh, coined by Matt Ridley, who's a science writer who wrote a book called The Rational Optimist. Mm -hmm. And he, yeah, and I just love this idea. He talks about how innovation happens when idea A and idea B meet and there's an offshoot. There's this idea C that combines them or takes some of each of them and that's the new better thing. It's like, you know, when you got chocolate and your peanut butter and suddenly you've got something new or like the printing press. The printing press was uh, part metallurgy, like goldsmithing techniques with woodblock carving, with uh, silk rag paper uh, and with ink that came from China, used for art and calligraphy, uh, and you put all of those together, and suddenly you had this new idea that itself accelerates innovation because it helps ideas spread to more people and then collide into each other and create mashups. To me, what this makes me think of is, you know, this is very Hegelian. You know, mm -hmm. so my philo philosophical background goes to Hegel, this, you know, thesis and antithesis meeting and, and emerging as synthesis, which then becomes the new thesis, which then uh, is met with a new antithesis. Um, or Dawkins, right? Richard Dawkins and his whole, when he coined the, the, the word meme, which means something, I guess, different now, you know, when we talk about internet memes. <laughs> yeah. um, but Dawkins talk about, talked a little bit about these copulating ideas, too, that, that just like genes uh, meet and, and then uh, interact and reproduce uh ideas can do that as well um and that's where innovation comes from and like you talk about in the book that's kind of it that's not a, a a diminishing resource right so if if i cut a grove of trees down um i have to wait for those to grow back or grow more someplace else but but ha having an idea sharing an idea using an idea doesn't diminish the the idea pool it actually that's enhances right. it that's absolutely right. Yeah, like the the use of an idea doesn't chip it, doesn't break it, doesn't wear it down. And if I give you an idea, I still have it too. Mm -hmm. So it has a very different – like if, if we have one barrel of oil, we can't both burn it. Right. But if we have an idea for how to make an engine that uses less oil, we can put it in a billion cars. All right. So the, the ideas itself scale in a different way. They're fundamentally different economics than do physical resources. What I, I'm wondering if you can speak to a couple of things, uh, and it's, it's kind of a two-part question, so I'll ask the first part first. When I look to um, innovation in, uh, in, in tech, I was just reading an article recently about um, the advent of vertical farming in cities where they're going to be able to, to create these vertical farms in buildings where they can you know, produce a bunch of food right there on the spot for people in the neighborhood. And, um, what, and you were just talking about the drop in price in solar. What led to that innovation? and the ability to do that was the explosion in cannabis growers using <laughs> using indoor growing equipment right and that led and they you know they were the test market they had demands on the products they had the money and so that pushed innovation in the industry when i think about um the internet and the push uh for broadband technology and sort of where we are now um it was really porn and gaming that demanded that right you brought up gaming a second ago uh that demanded that push now of course it's being used for all kinds of other things from defense to medical to science uh, innovation as well but it was really you know pokemon go and, and these kinds of things that push the need for more innovation and so i wonder if you can speak to that first how sometimes the the push for these innovations come from the unlikely places 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of the economy is driven by human desire, mm-hmm. right? So there's, there's this thing that um, Peter Thiel has said, which yeah. is, we wanted flying cars, instead we got 140 characters. But, you know, <laughs> F that. Like, my response to that is not very polite, because it turns out that people have a base innate desire to communicate uh-huh. to express themselves to connect with others and that's why you see like if facebook we think of it as like this trivial thing no it's actually this huge thing of being able to socialize we're a social species being able to know about your sister's kids and see their their photos even though she lives thousands of miles away right like that's a big deal yeah um so the the base human desires we have are what drive the flows of money in the you know marketplace, and that's what drives uh, where investment and innovation happens quite a lot. Yeah, I mean that's a weird thing. For, I, I I remember that Theo quote, and you know my Samsung Galaxy S six has more capabilities than um, the computing that was used to to put people on the moon, or what like a Star Trek tricorder was supposed to have, right? I mean that's it's, right. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable. And the reason we don't have bases on the moon is that no one has figured out a way in which that helps fulfill a whole lot of basic human desire. Uh, right? If there was a business model for it that was at a price that met, a price that was equal to or lower than the amount of human desire that it fulfilled, then we'd be doing it. I'm uh, pretty sure there's already a Starbucks there, just in, in anticipation <laughs> of when we show up. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, that, uh, okay, moving on then, because I got, I'm looking down at the time and already we're running short. Um, one more question about this, and then I want to move on to a, to a few other things. What about the reproduction of bad ideas, right? And so would, would the universe would be great. Wouldn't our culture be wonderful if only the, the, the great ideas were reproduced and rose to the top? But I think we can see, um, you know, in the era of Trump or of just fundamentalist religion or of all of the bad ideas out there, these reproduce too. They absolutely do. Unfortunately. And I and I think what we see is that with more... And sometimes they have like nine kids, yeah. <laughs> those bad and, ideas. Absolutely. And with more communications technology, it's easier for hatred or as for other bad ideas to spread, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's easier for people to find their pockets of people that have the same fears as them and to amplify those fears and to lash out. Despite that, the overall the pace of uh, social change is positive and we see empathy actually growing faster than that hatred like it's easier easy to fixate on trump but yeah. in the last uh, you know 4 years in 2012 we elected reelected a man named Barack Hussein Obama yeah, yeah. uh we got uh in my state we got legalized marijuana and legalized marriage equality hmm. defended by the voters Amazing. Uh, and that's those are big, big changes. So despite the news media want clicks and to get clicks and views, fear works. So they right. show the stuff that is scariest and that amplifies fear. And it makes all of us think that the scary things are happening a lot. But in general, the world is heading towards more peace more empathy, more connection. Yeah, that's really interesting because when you're talking about uh, peace, empathy, and connection, um, I've been doing a lot of research, again, as a, as a person who studies religion and religious ritual, um, in in the production and uh, disbursement of oxytocin and what causes that and when. And there's been a lot written on oxytocin recent, recently, the, you know, the empathy hormone. And some folks have said, hey, hang on a second, it's not all it's cracked up to be because when a, when a, a bear mauls you thinking that you're going to harm its cub it's oxytocin that makes it do that and so in group loyalty is also produced by oxytocin and so it's not just the creator of empathy because it also makes you hate the out group but when what folks that are are pushing back saying hang on what these technologies are are allowing us to do is to in to increase the our our conception of the human family to to mean the entire planet and so we're, we're we're kind of pushing the out group out Right. And so the in group literally becomes everybody. And these technologies are affording that possibility. Would you would you say that's accurate? I think that's absolutely right, is that we are tribal. We evolved in bands of tens or twenties of people. Mm -hmm. And we so we learned to love the in group and everybody else was scary. But now with media, our in group can be billions of people potentially. And that's the direction we're headed. 
exciting stuff, man. Let me ask you a question about more than human, and then we'll finish up our conversation with the with the Nexus and Crux and Apex okay. trilogy. Uh, so that book, uh, Embracing the Promise of Biological Enhancement, that was the first book you wrote? That was the first book I wrote, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so you wanted to take a look at what the science was of enhancing human mind and body and lifespan. I, and so tell us a little bit about where we are in that. What are some of the exciting things that are happening there? Well, I wanted to look at the science, but I especially also wanted to make a case for why it was moral, for mm -hmm. why letting people upgrade themselves or upgrade their families was a good idea rather than trying to control it. Um, we're making progress, slow progress. It's gone slower than I thought, but we're making progress in understanding where aging comes from. We have a big, big platform technology, technology that can touch everything else in gene therapy. Gene mm. therapy means the ability to edit genes in an already living person. Like editing genes in an unborn child, mm -hmm. if you catch them at the right time when there are eight cells in an embryo, is easier there's only eight cells no immune system but you and i have a trillion cells so editing our genes is really really hard uh, but we're making huge progress in that and when that really becomes sort of stable and trusted and viable that opens the doors to you know regeneration regrowing spinal cords that have been crushed uh, restoring eyesight to the blind restoring hearing to the to the deaf, uh, slowing the aging process, regrowing the cartilage in your knee. So maybe working on brain damage and restoring the ability of the brain to learn. So all of that becomes possible as it becomes easier to tweak the actual code of biology of the cells in your body. I almost wish a guy like Oliver Sacks lived long enough to see some of this stuff. Oh yeah. Definitely. Uh, so I haven't seen uh, the embryonic stem cell debate around lately, and is this why? Because we've made such advancements with these other kinds of cells? Yeah, technology has bypassed it. We learned that we could take an existing adult cell, not from an embryo, mm -hmm. and reprogram it to turn into any kind of cell. And that was the, the whole point of, of embryonic stem cells was that they could turn into any kind of cell. Now we can take a skin cell from you, and we can turn it into other kinds of cells. What are a couple of the things you're excited about that you think might be on the horizon? You said the tech is going slower than you anticipated when you wrote the book. The book was what, 2005? 2005 it yeah, came out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I, like I said, gene therapy is the one that I'm really excited about. And I think a lot of things we do with surgery today, mm -hmm. we will start to do by reprogramming cells in the body. I've got a bad ankle. Uh -huh. I'd love for more cartilage to grow there. And I'm pretty sure that you know, within my lifetime, we will inject some information, inject viruses that contain new genetic codes that tell the area around that ankle to grow more new cartilage. I brought up Star Trek before when I was talking about our phones and the communicator. And I, one of the things I, the, one of the running jokes of the old Star Trek that I loved was uh, when they went back in time in that one movie, I think it was Star Trek four and bones, you know, he's, he's looking at the state of 20th century medicine. And for him, it's like us going to the middle ages yeah. right? the whole time. He's like, my God, man, you people are barbaric in this century. What are you doing? That's absolutely right. That's, that's on the horizon. That's exciting. Yeah. Well, so let's get into, we only have a few minutes left. So let's talk about Nexus in that so the jump into writing fiction was huge again this is you know so you, you have this comfortable you know although taxing and difficult but a, a tech career and then you branch out into these other entrepreneurial areas and then you know writing nonfiction is is a difficult thing and certainly a step out into another area for you but at least one that's sort of connected to uh, you know the world you inhabiting and certainly a lot of your ideas uh, inhabit the Nexus series but but writing fiction is a whole other animals so what how did that start how did you decide hey i'm gonna i'm gonna be a sci-fi author i started doing it for fun mm. thinking i was writing a short story that no one would ever see yeah that's the and best and <laughs> yeah and then i found that i had a novel in my hands and i just decided to run with it do you know that's how tolkien started really yeah oh he, my gosh he was in a um there was a a, a pub in oxford called the uh the eagle and child and he would meet there with christopher marlowe and uh, c.s lewis yeah. and they would have drinks and they would uh, you know they would shoot the shit and uh and tolkien wanted to read his kids a bedtime story uh a mythological one and just wasn't either you know it wasn't happy we didn't want to read you know uh the aeneid to his kids and so he just <laughs> didn't you know he just didn't have anything he was pleased with and so he started jotting these stories down to have something to give to his 
kids uh, to read to them and he would he would run them by these guys in this little group in this little drinking group and they they were the ones who convinced him to publish it because he thought ah i'm just writing this bullshit for my kids uh lewis on the other hand was writing the lion the witch and the wardrobe with the intent of publishing it he was trying to write a, right. a, a, a christian you know mythos for children and he wanted to publish these and uh the guys in the group thought they were terrible <laughs> they were like hey man don't publish these these are god awful so it was tolkien who, who just thought he was writing something no one would ever see that wrote the masterpiece well i'm lucky that i had friends who were reading this and who encouraged me and then who also gave me feedback on on all the problems with my early drafts <laughs> until it got better and better were you surprised at the response i was very pleased i mean I, it's done better than 99 percent of, of books out there so i was incredibly pleased and, and yeah surprised i mean so nexus came out in 2013 and that's a uh, 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 full disclosure here i haven't read the second two i've read nexus and so those are on my list to get to now actually in the summer um but uh, Nexus won uh, with these uh, Prometheus Award, Endeavor Award, listed as Best Novel of the Year by NPR, shortlisted for the Arthur C. Clarke and Philip K. Dick Awards. And so that had to just blow you away. It was, yeah, it was an amazing reception. And Apex, the third book, just won the Philip K. Dick Award right. a few months ago. Oh, congratulations. So, thank you. Yeah, so it's it's been awesome. I, I like you know, it. People have bought it. It's sold copies. People find it exciting. And there's been good critical response as well. So that combination makes me quite happy. So for our audience, can you give us just a brief sketch of what the, the major plot line of the book is, the, yeah, the so series? That, yeah. So in Nexus, there's uh, a technology called Nexus. Mm -hmm. It's a street drug. It's a silvery vial, like or a silvery liquid in a vial. You mm -hmm. swallow it, and it puts uh, basically Wi-Fi in your brain, little nanobots attached to your neurons. Mm -hmm. And they broadcast... Uh, what your neurons are doing. And so if I take it and you take it, our brains start to sync up. Hmm. And we get, Cory Doctorow called it a, a weak telepathy. Okay. Uh, we also let people program their, their brains and so on. But it's highly illegal. It's a smart drug, and there's a, a horrible history in this world of people abusing uh, sort of neurotechnology, abusing brain technology and human enhancement. Hmm. And so the plot is this battle for who has control. There are these young, idealistic uh, grad students working on it and trying to make better versions and make it freely available. The U.S. government thinks it's terrible and has to be cracked down. The Chinese government is trying to use it for mind control and political assassination. And uh, our hapless protagonist, just a grad student, is sort of caught uh, in over his head between all these conflicting sides. I think uh, I, what's compelling to me about this, and that's a that's a great setup. Uh, you know, this, this series, things like Mr. Robot, uh, folks are really interested in this idea of here we sit on, again on this precipice of all of these amazing possibilities. Um, but just like when you know with the internet and then with Internet 2.0, so much possibility, so much innovation, so much transformation in terms of lifestyle and quality of life. But then, you know, so much trash and so much nefarious content and the kind of dark side of humanity comes along with it as well and so one of the things i appreciate about the book is that very thing is that we're always in a race with ourselves between our kind of higher nature and our lower nature we sure are and so that's the debate and i and i try to set it up so that everyone has their realistic motivations everyone in the book believes that they're a good guy believes that they're on the right side they're protecting people by locking down this terrible technology they're liberating people by making it freely available they're helping their country um, and that makes the conflict more fun what i think is interesting is something that you said earlier when we were talking about gmos and transhumanism uh and you've talked about empathy a lot in this conversation uh some of these ideas uh which might seem so far-fetched when some Someone reads the book uh, in one sense uh, you're talking about technologies that are or could be you know emerging as we speak or, or on the horizon over the next 20 to 50 years but in another sense you're already you're talking about things that that evolution has geared uh, us with that you know for a very long time and so when you bring up the the connection between empathy and telepathy I mean a highly tuned empathy is a sort of telepathy is it not that's right. And I could go further than that. It, it is basic human abilities, but because of our desires, we've crafted technology in that direction already. So when I talk about Nexus, it's this technology in your brain, but how far is it from cell phones? Like cell phones are very far technologically, but they have all the same social issues. You know, mm. They can spread um, negative ideas and thoughts via Facebook or Twitter or whatever. They can take pictures of people abusing their power. They can connect families together. And so all the same effects sort of happen with current uh, information technology. 
we had uh, that's fascinating we had howard bloom on do you know howard uh, yeah howard's amazing we had howard on a couple of weeks ago and you know his whole uh, study of global brain right and this yeah. and he's you know what he talked about was the reason you know he's the most successful music publicist in the history of the world and he went into it as a kind of science experiment of understanding mass mind and and trying to you know and how he explained it on the show is that when he would find an artist like prince or michael jackson or peter gabriel or you know paul simon or david byrne uh that these people had a a, a deep deep uh, profound universal truth in them that they were able to express that if he could get it out of them in the right way would trigger something in tens of millions of people that was an identification that people went i that truth is something i own as well that is in me but i've never been able to language it that way before yeah and the, you know and when i read nexus i had the same sort of feeling that howard was talking about that this drug was a was was you just manifesting this in a concrete fashion yeah so howard's book the global brain was a big influence on me and that's sort of what i was trying to write about like sort of the the genesis of that or genesis a new layer of it uh and if you when you read book two and book three you'll see sort of where it goes and in, in thinking about that how were you able to keep up the uh you know, I mean, so, so frequently when someone writes a trilogy, it loses energy or, or, or kind of loses focus partway through. But all of the press that I've read just says that the trilogy just gets stronger and stronger and finishes. Well, I think I became a better writer, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was my first novel. And I think the ideas in Nexus were amazing. Yeah. Uh, I think I learned more about how to write good characters uh, in later books. And then you just sort of amp things up. You know, Nexus is about sort of the debate. Should this technology get out or not? And then uh, Crux and Apex are about the consequences of what happens when it does get out and as it gets to more and more people and changes the world for good and bad. So you set yourself up with good characters and a good and a fleshed out world and, and a really uh, a plot that matters. And then you're able to just, you know, run with it from there. Is that what you're saying? That, yeah, exactly. That's fantastic, man. So can uh, in our final few minutes here, um, can I ask you about the option? Uh, yeah. So it, it was optioned by Paramount and Darren Aronofsky. Uh -huh. They let it go. It's now optioned uh, for TV okay. by a, a TV production company, uh, and we'll just see. It, see what these, Yeah, these things take multiple swings at bat before sure. they happen. But fingers crossed. We'll see it on the screen sometime. Congratulations on that. Even, you know, you, uh, I, I've had a few folks that I've known that have had similar things happen, and, yeah, sometimes it'll something will sit on the shelf for a couple of years or it'll bounce around between a few places. But just the fact that there's interest uh, is a, is a, is a nod to you for how uh, poignant the books are. Always a good thing. Yeah. And I love how seeing like just, uh, you know, the NPR review that just came up today. So does that, it's always great when you wrote something a few years ago, but then, you know, suddenly it gets more traction and people start spreading. It is. I was surprised to see it. a new review of a three-year-old book. So that's great. Uh, thank you so much for being with us, Ramirez. This has been fantastic. It's my pleasure, Andy. Thanks for having me on the show. Is there anything you want to add here at the end that we didn't cover? Uh, no, I mean, if people want to find me, they can follow me on Twitter at, at Ramez or at my website, RamezNam.com. And you, uh, yeah, we'll link to that stuff on our site as well. And uh, anything you want to say here at the end about Singularity University and your work there? Uh, we can have a whole other segment on that. Okay, yeah, so maybe I'll have you on another time to talk about Sounds that. Sounds like fun. We'll link to all that. And thank you for the work you're doing, man, and for your passion in it and for being, uh, as you said in the beginning, one of those immigrants that make this country and this place uh, richer. Thank you so place. much, Andy. It's an honor to be here. Thanks for the time. Have a good rest of your day. You too. You've been listening to On the Block Radio, folks. Our guest is Ramez Nam, and we will see you on the other side. Network matter is something that's coming, and it, it, it's here already in a lot of ways. I have a remote control that controls the LED lights over my roof. I just wanted to write something that was a little bit gonzo. I think about the commercial interests and uh, the brand and advertising interests and what are those people going to do with it uh, and how it affects kind of, I don't know, retail and the stock market and things like that. And if I had a direct link to somebody's brain, I'm sure that I would see a lot of like advertising and spam and so on. So I wanted to just play with that. You look 30, 40 years from now, you can ask me the power of your smartphone that is sub one cent and embedded into every bottle of water, every box of detergent on the shelves. What's it going to do? Um, so I think that's the world around us is going to seem less inanimate and more animate in general. There's going to be almost no such thing as an inanimate object to a certain extent.
Ideas spread for lots of reasons. It might be a catchy tune or a funny joke that you've heard that sticks in the brain and makes you want to propagate it, to tell others. But one reason that we know that ideas stick and spread is because they're useful. The useful ones propagate. So an example is the wheel. The wheel wasn't invented in Egypt, okay? but it was improved upon hundreds of years later in Sumeria by going from a solid disk to spokes. How did it get to Sumeria? Well, merchants used it to travel and spread their goods from point A to point B. So that utility to them, the fact that it was a useful invention, helped the invention itself spread from place to place. It was carried by humans to other places where then it was improved upon by other people. A very important factor is that there's an evolution happening of ideas. Lots of ideas are tried, lots of ideas are proposed, uh, many of them don't work out for whatever reason. They're not true or they're not a good innovation. But then ideas pop up that do pass sort of the Darwinian fitness test, if you will, and they go on to thrive and they spread. And then they meet other ideas, and those ideas combine. Uh, Matt Ridley talks about that as idea sex, when two ideas meet. Uh, and then they can give birth to new ideas. Any technique that develops new diversity of ideas helps that Darwinian evolution. So Thomas Edison, for example, experimented with thousands of different filaments for the light bulb before he got to one that worked. So that's another way that Darwinian evolution can happen. Lots of creation of diversity and then a filter that picks just the ones that people want to pass on for whatever reason. So this process of innovation, of spreading ideas from person to person, one of the things we've been doing, some of the ideas we've been creating, are accelerators of that process. When we invented writing, maybe five to 7,000 years ago, that accelerated the spread of ideas. When we went from writing on scrolls to the printing press that could print things thousands of times faster than monks could transcribe them by hand, that accelerated the spread of ideas and helped launch the scientific revolution and helped accelerate the Renaissance. And now with the internet, ideas can spread very, very rapidly. Funny cat pictures, of course, utilize that, but so do scientific papers. So do dialogue between researchers or scholars in all sorts of fields. So everything we're doing in society, both increasing the number of people who are educated, giving them access to more tools to do their research, and giving them more ways to communicate more quickly, is all accelerating this process of Darwinian evolution of ideas. You've been listening to On the Block Radio with Andrew Gurevich. The show is produced in Portland, Oregon by Michael DiNapoli at MD Productions. Theme music by Moving the Mountain. Closing music by Jonathan Oak. Look us up on the web at ontheblockradio.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Don't forget to tune in next week for a brand new episode. Previous episodes can be found on our website. Thanks for listening. Oh, you beautiful kitty kitties. Oh, look at you out there. Beauty like a bolt, light in a darkened hallway. New minds looking at this world, at our lives, with the perspective of apocalypse children. Standing dusty in the barren highways Standing broken before the fathers Who are meant to make us whole But who only lied to us About what it meant to be a man About what it meant to be a woman About what it meant to be a child Of this doomed, doomed age